Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I am Andrew Capetta, the Manager of Collection and Exhibition Programs at the Cleveland Museum of Art, and I'd like to welcome you to today's desktop dialogue. Uh, we're going to start in a minute and wait for other guests to join us. But in the meantime, uh, please familiarize yourself with the Q&A interface uh, to the right of your screen. You can use this to make comments or ask questions during the program at any time. You can include your name or remain anonymous. Uh, we will select some of them to answer at the end of the program, and we will do our best to respond to as many as we can in the allotted time. Uh, we will also use the Q&A to post links to the artworks on CMA's, CMA's collection online uh, and additional information and resources that you might find useful. Uh, we would also like to learn a little bit more about you, so if you have time now or later, please fill out the survey, which has already been shared in the q and It'd be great to, to get a better sense of who's here with us. So today we're going to be discussing images of leadership. Um, in light of the presidential election and the upcoming presidential debate here in Cleveland on September 29th, U.S. citizens here in Cleveland and also across the country are really thinking about who they would like to lead the country. Um, if you have a moment now, I would like to ask you out there um, <clears throat> to share some of the characteristics and qualities that you look for in a leader whether that is political or not. Just pop your answer into the q and It'd be great to see what all of us sort of value uh, collectively. So for this afternoon's discussion, we're gonna go back in time and consider how images and representations of leaders from the ancient Greek and Roman world, and particular interpretations of them, uh, influence understandings of, understandings of what leadership can look like in the United States today. Uh, our guest this afternoon knows just a few things uh, about ancient Greek, the ancient Greek and Roman world. Uh, Seth Pednick, who is the curator of Greek and Roman art here at CMA. Welcome, Seth. It's great to have you. Thank you, Andrew. It's great to be here. So Seth and I are going to have a conversation uh, about some works of art. This will last about 25 minutes or so. Uh, and after that, we will answer some of your questions for about 10 minutes. So different from the last few sessions, we're going to just stay right here in one place. So no jumping to Zoom. Um, no worries about that. So um, I thought that we'd start off with, um, you know, a representation of George Washington, um, the first president of the U.S., so, because for leadership in the U.S., Washington sets a particular standard, and we're really lucky to have a really early portrait of Washington uh, by Charles Wilson Peale. Uh, it's from around 1779. Um, here, uh, Washington is not the president, which he became in April 1789, but he is shown as the commander in chief of the Continental Army during the American Revolutionary War, specifically after two decisive wins against uh, mercenary armies in Trenton, New Jersey, and the British Army in Princeton, New Jersey in late 1776 and early 1777. Um, and if we can zoom in, you'll see that the, the reason why we sort of, we ha will have a sense of, of all the accoutrements or the reasons why we know where we, you know, that why this depicts a particular time and place, but the first thing is a blue sash which shows that he's commander in chief. Um, and if we just go to the right of the portrait, uh, we get sort of more details that show him as a military leader. There's that Revolutionary War battle flag, which has 13 stars. Below that, there is the man, the revolutionary who's carrying the flag, a horse that looks at Washington really adoringly. Um, and on the lower uh, sort of right, uh, we see some uh, the captured flags from the opposing forces. Um, and he leans, of course, on a cannon, right? So all of these sort of um, sort of um, parts of the sort of the background that frame Washington really show him as a military leader. Uh, but when we zoom out again and look at his pose, it really um, you know shows him rather relaxed, and it really resembles a lot of uh, British uh, painting or portrait conventions um, of setting a full-length portrait of an often notable or wealthy white gentleman in a, in a sort of a meaningful landscape, right? Um, the last thing is that this, this image was incredibly popular. There were many copies, at least nine made, uh, by Peel, and they went across the world. Um, and uh, they showed different details. Um, but there were other conventions, other ways of, of showing Washington um, early in our country's history. And I just want to share quickly this, 18th, this sculpture by Horatio Greeno, uh, which was commissioned in 1832. Uh, Greeno was born in the U.S., 
uh, but lived in Italy at the time and was commissioned by the U.S. government to make a sculpture of Washington uh, that was originally supposed to be placed at the center of the rotunda of the U.S. Capitol building where the Senate and the Re House of Representatives meet. And it was completed in 1840. Um, it's a monumental sculpture. It's like 11-ish feet tall. It's in the Smithsonian's collection. Um, uh, we see we have some great comments coming in, which I'll get to in a moment. But Seth, um, while I'm gathering those, as a curator and historian of ancient art, right, specifically Greek art, but also curating Roman art, what strikes you about this sculpture, especially in comparison to the Peel? Well, I, I'm certainly not a, a scholar of American art, so I can't claim to be an expert on images of George Washington. But when I see this, I think the first word that comes to mind is incongruous. The, the head, the face looks like George Washington, but the body, to me, looks very much like a, a very famous sculpture of Zeus that we know stood in the Temple of Zeus at Olympia. Um, there are some differences, of course, not just the head, but Washington here is holding a sword. Uh, I think he's holding the sword down as if to say, giving peace and giving power to the people. Um, Zeus would have held his thunderbolt and, and probably a scepter in his upraised hand. Maybe there would have been an eagle here. So it's not a precise copy, but as I say, very incongruous. It's not the way that I think of George Washington. And, and the idea of using a model of the king of the Greek gods as a way of portraying an American president who, who led this great battle to free our country from kingship just strikes me as unusual and, and surprising. And, and maybe that explains why this didn't become the, the iconic image of Washington. Yeah, and I think I think we have an example of a of a sculpture that's right similar, that that's based on um, sort right. of this this kind of iconic image of Zeus or representation I, of Zeus. I mentioned the image of Zeus that stood in Olympia, and we know a lot about that statue, um, but unfortunately, it's gone now. We know that it was created in the fifth century BC. Um, eventually, it was taken to Constantinople, but in the fifth century AD, so almost. Uh, about a thousand years after it was created, it was destroyed by fire. Um, but we have a number of great representations like this one that give us a pretty good idea of what that sculpture looked like. So this is a sculpture made of marble. It's larger than life. Um, and it's in the Getty Museum in Los Angeles. Um, you can see it's slightly damaged. So we don't have the scepter or the thunderbolt that I mentioned or the, the eagle, perhaps. <coughs> Um, his head is damaged, but you see here at least a sense of what Zeus would look like, right? A bearded head, a bearded face, very different from what we see on Washington. And then this very impressive musculature, right? <laughs> and, and maybe George Washington looked like that, but most of the images that we have of him don't show his bare yeah. chest. So, so it, yeah. it's not something that, that we know. Um, no. I should mention... This one at the Getty is larger than life, but the original, the one that Phidias made for the temple in, in Olympia, was much, much larger than life. It was about 12 meters tall, we're told, and it was not made of marble like this one. It was made of gold and ivory. It was such a magnificent sight. It was considered one of the wonders of the ancient world. And unlike most of the other wonders of the ancient world, this was one that was actually worshipped. So again, the idea of modeling an image of the president on an image that would have been worshipped and that would have been just dazzling to behold is a little bit incongruous. Yeah, and here, and here we see them together. Yeah, like like a cult statue. No, and I think we have some wonderful responses just to share them. People saying that what they think of of leadership is service, putting the team above oneself, which is interesting. With that mentioning that sort of sword, maybe giving the power, intelligent, well-educated, military leadership and courage, trustworthy, charismatic, diplomatic. These are all really great qualities and and um, that we all look for, I think, in, in, in a leader. Um, and then, Seth, I, I really like that um, uh, you, you mentioned how incongruous was to you. It would have been to people at the time as well, the Greeno, that is, right? Um, because it didn't, it felt so divorced, right, from how people knew him, the clothes, right, uh, or the lack of clothes, I should say, the bare chest, 
right? This is not um, some of those people I imagine maybe even knew um, Washington in his time, right? That might, they could have, right? Maybe at a very young age. Um, uh, so it, it's not, it didn't fit with that, their image of him. But it also makes me think of this idea of using a mythological figure to depict a historical figure. Um, and that might have been another sort of a, a bit sort of um, strange. But then when I look at the peel, which if we can go to that again, um, the peel, right, certainly allied certain difficult truths about the United States. They're like kind of alighted and edited out. Um, you know, Washington and the American the leadership of the United States, uh, the building of this country is predicated on displacement of indigenous people, uh, enslaving Africans. And so there is, um, that's sort of not shown here, right? He's kind of just kind of hero wise in this as this gentleman sort of a military leader. Um, now, just to move on next, there, I like that, you know, you had this uneasiness, the people in the early 19th century had an uneasiness. Um, showing Washington as a, as a deity. But what's interesting is that we live with these allusions to the Greek and Roman world um, and images of Washington on our money. Uh, and here we have a quarter. Um, Seth, what are some of the characteristically ancient Greek, Greek and Roman aspects of the design here? Well, certainly coinage has a long, long history that, that begins in the ancient Mediterranean world. And, and so just the fact of having a piece of metal stamped with important images and words is something that we can trace back um, to classical antiquity. In this case, um, on the, the head side, what we call the obverse, uh, we see George Washington's head. And I think, as you were saying, that's something that we're now totally used to. But if we, if we look back at the history of US coinage, it wasn't something that came at the beginning, right? It was only, I believe, in 1932 that Washington's head appears on, on the head side of the quarter. And if you look above his head here, it says liberty, right? This is this very important notion about what it means to be American that, that we hold so dear. Previously to the Washington quarters, it wasn't just the word liberty. It was actually the personification, libertas, uh, lady liberty who appeared on quarters. And then in 1932, which is 100 years after the, the statue that was commissioned by Greenaw, um, at that point, maybe people felt comfortable having an image of this leader who maybe by 1932, he was less of an historical figure and a little bit more of uh, a monumental figure. And so maybe we feel comfortable by that point. Um, if we look at the reverse of the coin, we see an eagle, which is also an image that has a long classical tradition, right? It's the bird that's connected with Zeus. Um, and if you look beneath the eagle, you see these the arrows, right? A, a sign of war. And below that, the olive sprigs, a sign of peace, but also a sign that was connected with Zeus in the ancient world and with Olympia. If, if you won at the ancient Olympic Games, which were held in honor of Zeus, you were crowned with olive branches, right? So there is this complicated relationship, I think, between these images that we hold dear in America in the 21st century and images that go back well into classical antiquity. And even the idea of the coin, right, or the idea of putting a head on a coin, right, or a leader on a coin isn't, right, an ancient uh, Greek sort of innovation or, or maybe yeah, not a but, tradition. But it's interesting... Know. It's interesting, too, that if we go to our next image, um, it is an ancient coin with a head on it. But in the beginnings of ancient coinage, they didn't put images of their leaders on their coins. This is a coin that was minted, we think, during the reign of Alexander the Great. Um, and there are some people who would say, well, that's an image of Alexander in the likeness of Heracles on, on the obverse side of the coin. Most people would say, no, that's Heracles himself. We can identify him pretty easily because he has this lion skin over his head, right? Heracles is this famous hero, a son of Zeus, who wrestled uh, the Nemean lion and then skinned the beast and wore its skin um, as protection, but also as a token of, of his victory and of his greatness, right? And then on the reverse of the coin, we see a seated figure of Zeus, not exactly like the statue that stood in the temple that we were talking about earlier, but pretty similar. You see he has a scepter in his left hand and an eagle in his right hand. 
Um, and alongside the scepter is a short inscription that tells us that this is a coin of Alexander. So all these things are carefully calculated by Alexander to connect himself to Heracles first, this great hero, and then to Zeus. Uh, Alexander and his, his father, Philip, traced their lineage, believe it or not, Heracles and Zeus, right? And so uh. power is, is legitimate because I, I spring from this uh, important and impressive line. And then what happened after? Like, what, what about successive generations? Right, so if we go to our next coin, Alexander, as, as most people know, died very young. But even at, his, at this young age, he had already conquered most of the known world. And when he died, um, it was unclear what the plans for succession were. And some of his generals fought to take over different parts of the empire. And this is a coin that is minted by one of those generals, Lysimachus, who becomes king in Thrace. And we know it's minted by Lysimachus because on the reverse, like the last one said Alexander, this one says King Lysimachus. The image on the reverse on the right here is not seated Zeus, but seated Athena, uh, a goddess of warfare, right? And Athena is holding in her hand the small goddess Nike, the, the personification of victory. And then on the obverse, we see this head, which is not wearing a lion skin, but has this ram's horn in it. And the ram's horn is a different sign. That's a sign that's connected with the Egyptian god Amun, um, who by this time is sometimes associated with Zeus. But uh, Alexander famously is said to have claimed descent not only from Heracles and Zeus, but also from Amun Re. So in Egypt, he's a god. Um, in Greece, he's a god. And Lysimachus is connecting himself to Alexander and to these gods, and and thereby trying to legitimize his claims. So so far, I think we've been sort of settling on a lot of images of, of sort of male leaders. Um, and this year, like I'm thinking, you know, we have another opportunity to elect a woman, and this for the first time a woman of color on as part of a major party ticket. And I'm thinking of Kamala Harris. Was there any sort of diversity in leadership in? the ancient Greek and Roman world. Absolutely. It's, it's a different kind of diversity than we have today, and leaders were not democratically elected. Um, but if we look at our next coin, it belongs to this same lineage, right? But here, the first thing you'll probably notice is that the head on the obverse side here is a woman, right? It's not, it's not a man anymore. And this is a woman who's wearing a veil and a crown that we would associate with Hera, and if you look closely on her ear, she has that same horn that we saw in Alexander's head. Um, and that's the same sign, uh, the connection to Amun. But here we know that this is an, an image of Arsinoe, um, uh, an important Hellenistic queen. So I mentioned Lysimachus being one of the followers of Alexander. Another of the generals who takes power is Ptolemy. And Ptolemy's daughter is Arsinoe, who we see here. Arsinoe marries Lysimachus, who's much older, and after Lysimachus dies, Arsinoe moves back to Egypt and marries her own brother. And we see a couple of allusions to that on the reverse of this coin. We see the, the twin cornucopias, one for Arsinoe, one for her brother Ptolemy, um, who then takes on the additional name Philadelphus, and we see that name on the back of the coin, which is the same word that gives us the name for our city, Philadelphia, right? The city of brotherly love. But here it's a much more literal, uh, literal. meaning of that word. <laughs> right? that. But, but there was precedent for this. So she's, she's getting power by marrying her brother, which sounds quite odd to us. But in ancient Egypt, Osiris was married to his sister Isis. And in Greece, Zeus was married to his sister Hera. And so this idea of divine siblings ruling is something that, that made sense to the people of the time. Yeah. But th that also means that her power is sort of contingent, right, upon a male figure, though, too, right? So it's not, right, she doesn't have power enough herself. And even that, that ram's horn is so subtle there, right? It's below the, it's below the veil, right? It's sort of like not so prominently um, displayed. 
Um, are there other, uh, what, about in, what about in the Roman world? Uh, we're kind of in the Hellenistic world. Is there examples of other kinds of leaders and also I mean, leaders from different backgrounds and also do the conventions change um, of showing those leaders, right, of maybe different gender or, you know, racial backgrounds? Sure. Yeah, there are, there are definitely different um, different ways of showing leaders. And our, our next image shows a really remarkable object. This is now in Berlin. Um, and I believe it's unique in being, this is a painted portrait, a uh, tempera on wood. So if you think of the, the, the well-known Fayum mummy portraits, we have a few in our collection here in Cleveland, and I'm sure people have seen them elsewhere that were placed over the head of a mummy in Roman Egypt. This is a similar technique, but not meant to be placed over a mummy's head. This is meant to portray the imperial family. And we know that this is the imperial family in a few ways. Um, number one, we can recognize the people here. So the woman is Julia Domna, and the man at the upper right is Septimius Severus. And the reason that I brought this image in, into the conversation is because you're asking about diversity. And we know that Septimius came from a family of North African descent. So his, the, his mother's family came from Italy, but his father's family came from North Africa. They spoke Punic, or the, the same language that, that Hannibal, the leader of Carthage, spoke. Um, and we're told that Septimius himself when he became emperor or throughout his life, spoke Latin with an African accent. Um, and if you look at the way that he's portrayed here, his skin does appear to be a little bit darker in tone um, than that of his wife, Julia Domna. And, and I should add, she uh, was from a family in Syria. So also outside of what many people might think of as the Roman mainstream. So by that time, um, the Roman Empire is definitely a very cosmopolitan place. Mm -hmm. And to have a leader like this depicted in that way makes sense. Yeah. yeah, and so it's interesting to see that the only designation of his, of of how, as you said, his being outside the Roman mainstream, or what we think of as a Roman mainstream, is just literally his skin tone. But that might also just connote that the fact that there was no, it was, it was just portraying him as him, and he was a leader, right? There was no different way of showing um, him, um, which I think is quite um, interesting. Um, now I see that there's something interesting going on in the lower left. One of the faces seems to be removed, but like not accidentally, but purposely, because the, the whole thing is intact, right? <laughs> What's yeah. going on there? So this this uh, object, like I said, is is unique in showing the the family, but it also is mentioned many times by scholars because of that face that has been definitely erased. From the image, right? And as you say, it's it's clearly done intentionally. It's not broken um, that in, in a way that, that that destroyed that face. And in fact, we're told that if you look closely at this, people have examined it. It's not just effaced, but it's actually um, covered with excrement. So someone w went to great lengths to remove this image. And as I said, we know who these people are. <laughs> with anger. Yes, with anger. Um, <laughs> We know who these people are. It's it's the imperial family. We know quite a lot about them. So it's Septimius at the top right. It's Julia Domna at the top left. And we know that they had two sons who went on to become emperors. One was Caracalla, who, who's more well-known because his reign lasted longer. The other is Geta. And it's almost certainly Geta who has been removed here because Caracalla hated his brother. Um and he not only ordered his murder, but after his murder, um, also issued a, what we call now damnatio memoriae, a mm. damnation of his memory. And this was something that goes back to the Roman Republic. If, if the Roman Senate deemed someone a true enemy of the state, they mm. could have their, their image, their name, everything about them obliterated from memory. And for obvious reasons, this is something that's difficult to study, right? These people have been removed in many ways, but there are other instances like this of images that have been erased and in other instances of names that have been erased from inscriptions. It's interesting that, you know, in this case, it's sort of used instead of like maybe something that is maybe seen as the, for the benefit of the people, right, to remove of someone, a poor leader, right? Um, from the record, right? This is sort of a, a really authoritarian 
uh, gesture in, in a lot of ways. Um, is there any, do you have an example of, of, um, of something where it's sort of for the benefit of the people, much like I think what's happening right now with Confederate monuments, right? Removing them from public context of importance and veneration, but not necessarily just destroying them, right? But, but removing them from being, right, uh, seen as important. Yeah, I, I think um, that's one of the of, issues. One of the issues today with these monuments that's not discussed as much is what to do with them after we remove them. If, if we decide they're they're inappropriate to be in a public place to be venerated, we still um, should remember that period of our history in in an appropriate way. Domnatio is a little bit different from that, and if we look yeah. at our next example, um, this is an image in the CMA collection of a head. And I think most uh, scholars of, of Roman art history and archeology span would look at that and say, well, that is the emperor Vespasian. And it is the emperor Vespasian. But if we look more carefully, there are a few unusual aspects of this. And I think we have a side view and a back view that should bear this out a little bit better. This image did not begin as an image of Vespasian. Uh, it began, we think, as an image of the Emperor Nero, who is more infamous than famous now, right? He uh, is famous for lots of bad things that he did during his reign, and he also suffered damnatio. And so if you look particularly at the back of this head, you can see there's a line across it where this, mm. this statue had a haircut, a pretty severe haircut. Um, and Vespasian did have, I'm sorry, Nero did have much longer hair than Vespasian. And so they've taken care of that in order to turn this uh, from Nero into Vespasian. And another aspect that we see is the receding lower lip, which is something that we see in images of Nero, but that would be hard to remove from a, a head carved of stone. So now we only have a, a, f a few minutes here, but we've been kind of focusing on this idea of the uh, you know, the image of the leader as sort of like a god or some deity, right? Um, even in the U.S. With, with George Washington, are there other archetypes of leadership in the uh, ancient sort of world um, that yeah. we can sort of look to? And I think we have a couple more examples to look at here. Um one great example is the Emperor Marcus Aurelius, who, unlike a lot of his predecessors, did not want to be portrayed as a military leader in most cases. And so we're actually looking at two images here. On the left is a very famous image, a statue that's in the Vatican that most people are probably familiar with, the Prima Porta Augustus. And this is, I think, how most people think of a Roman emperor. If you're asked to conjure up an image, you come up with this one in military garb, holding your hand out in some sort of grand address, right? If you look at the image on the right, it's very, very different from that. And yet, it is monumental in scale. It is uh, incredibly well executed, a, a larger-than-life bronze sculpture um, that we think must represent an emperor because of this high quality of, of workmanship, because of the scale Obviously, we're missing the head, so we can't be 100% sure. But if there were an emperor who wanted to portray himself in this way, not in military dress, but in Greek dress, he's wearing a keton and himation, even down to the details of his sandals. The sandals are a kind of sandal um, that was favored by Hellenistic philosophers. So a couple centuries before this was made, this is made probably towards the end of the second century AD. If there's an emperor who wants to be portrayed as a philosopher, it's Marcus Aurelius. Mm -hmm. And so almost certainly this is uh, a larger-than-life bronze portrait statue of Marcus Aurelius. That's really interesting to kind of think about the military right leader of the left and this sort of philosopher um, on the right. Um, I'm going to ask our audience, if you feel free to, to ask, start asking questions, because we're going to turn to that literally uh, in um, a minute, but I'd like to maybe end by thinking about a portrait that's, I think, in a lot of our consciousness, um, and that's the most recent presidential portrait, Kende Wiley's 2017 portrait of President Obama. 
And it's very interesting to me as I um, see this now, and especially after seeing Marcus Aurelius, and I think of the peel of Washington, which we don't need to look at again. I think it's in our mind, a gentleman, but a military leader. Um, I start to, and, and thinking about that comparison we just saw, I start seeing Obama now, this sort of, you know, refle- uh, sitting down, seated, hands crossed over his shoulders, very sort of reflective, right? And he's almost like a, a philosopher president. Um, I'd love to hear what other people out there might think, their reactions to this portrait. But while we're getting questions um, and also um, getting comments, Seth, um, uh, I know you saw this painting in person. What was your reaction to it? Uh, Well, I I think very much in line with what you were just saying. I I was fortunate to be in Washington at the beginning of this year um, and went over with a couple friends to see this painting. And the first thing I noticed was that when I walked into the National Portrait Gallery, um, people were asking, are you here to see the Obama portrait? And to get to the Obama portrait, you walk past all the portraits of the previous presidents. Mm -hmm. And so by the time you get to this, you do see this distinctive difference between what has come before and and what has come most recently. Uh, and, And there was also a line of people lined up to see this painting. So the power of the painting or maybe the power of the president, or maybe both, um, was definitely palpable. No, it's great. And um, while we're waiting for uh, questions, I, some, an anonymous viewer said, is it, is it refreshing to know that the intermingling with North Africa and Middle East was not unusual, you know, at least thinking historically, which I, I, I agree. And that was somewhat of our, that was really, you know, part of our, our thinking with, with, with thinking about all of this. Um, yeah, and then the one other thing, of course, that's, you know, maybe fairly obvious is how Obama himself as the first black president also broke from convention as well, right? Um, in, in that way, right? That, um, you know, uh, a parade of sort of white male leaders, right, um, up until him, and hopefully we'll keep breaking um, with those. Right. And and also that Obama chose a black artist to make the painting, right? So mm. uh, a precedent on two different levels. Yes. No. Agreed. Um, we have another anonymous viewer that says they love the statue of Marcus Aurelius. I would agree. Um, it's quite wonderful. That is in CMA's collection. So if you're in the Cleveland area, Northeast Ohio. Please um, take a visit. Just get a ticket uh, beforehand. Excellent. And so you said there was a line to get in, not a line to get a line to take a picture with this. How many? Uh, how many people <laughs> were you? How were? How many people were in front of you? I mean, I didn't have to wait hours to see it, but but five or ten minutes probably before I had my moment with the painting, and and we were chatting earlier and noticed that um, this painting of Obama and the painting of Michelle Obama are doing a a brief national tour next year. Unfortunately, it's not coming to Cleveland. Um, I think the Art Institute in Chicago is the closest it will get to us. But if you don't make it to D.C., uh, a few other places where you might be able to see it. Totally. It's really, um, you know, exciting that it's making that tour. Uh, An anonymous... um uh, and also with with the portrait of Michelle Obama by Amy Sherald, which I will say that my colleague Kijo Lee, and I'll give people information, is we'll be discussing that portrait um, along with another work of art in next week's Close Looking at a Distance. Uh, uh, an anonymous uh, viewer says, it looks to me that his power, and I think you were talking about Obama, is listening, taking in and being set in something of concern for all of us, nature, the environment, and understanding the need to protect our environment. That's a really nice interpretation. Thank you for that. I also know that there are um, plants that are sort of meaningful to his sort of um, his life and, you know, where he lived. I know that was a sort of a significant uh, choice there. So there are sort of specific biographical um, uh, details, right? Um, Actually, I have a question maybe uh, that's maybe a bit unusual, but if we had the head of Marcus Aurelius, right, what would it have looked like? That's a good question. Um, He would have had curly hair and and a big curly beard, right? So Mm -hmm. if you look at Augustus, Augustus is clean shaven. um, And just like today, um, hairstyles and facial hairstyles went in and out of fashion in antiquity. Um, 
We saw the image of Septimius earlier, and Septimius Severus is also bearded. And there's some thought that Septimius, who comes to power at the end of the second century AD, um, after a period of upheaval in the empire, is portraying himself in a way as connected to Marcus Aurelius. So he, he was not the biological son of Marcus Aurelius, but he tried to project himself as the legitimate offspring of, of Marcus in that way. And so this image of Septimius gives you some idea, and there are lots of surviving heads of Marcus Aurelius that, that one could look at in other museums, just not the head, unfortunately, for our bronze statue. Right. Thank you for that. We have some, uh, if we go back to the portrait of Obama, I think there's some great questions about it. Um, first is, you know, can you talk a little bit about the background of the Obama portrait? And from what I do know of it, it's not in our collection, this is in the Smithsonian, but we are sharing it. I do know that it is, um, you know, there are these flowers that have sort of significance to him. And, and someone else similarly uh, personal significance, like his his upbringing in Hawaii, for example. Um, do you see any significance to the vegetation uh, overlapping of President Obama's um, legs, as opposed to most leaders' figures or portrait figures? And I think that's a really um, wonderful detail that I find um, deeply interesting here. I guess I know you know. Uh, since you're not a sort of, I know, a, a historian or scholar of contemporary art or a critic, but as a person with a with an eye, right, as an art viewer, uh, what what sort of, what does that connote? Because I think it, it is kind of interesting. Yeah, I think there definitely is this more gentle portrayal of the leader. I, I notice also that he's wearing a suit, but his top button is unbuttoned. He's not wearing a tie. It's definitely a much more relaxed looking president than a lot of the more formal portraits that came before him. Yeah, and I really like um, our anonymous viewer that talked about this idea of listening and sort of being sort of, you know, absorbing himself in this sort of environment, something that we're thinking right now, I think, about about our environment quite a bit with the fires on the, on the West Coast, uh, as well as many other things, just... Uh, so that might be um, in particular in our mind, but there is something about that that sort of him being sort of sort of almost surrounding surrounding by it. He almost doesn't stand, you know, he stands out obviously, but he's also of of the of 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 um, of our shared environment in a way. You know, it's maybe a different way of thinking of being of the people. Maybe that's me going in an odd uh, tangent, but it is one of those details. The uh, the sort of vegetation creeping up the leg, um, or, you know, that is, I think, quite striking. Um, an anonymous um, uh, viewer says there's a lovely statue at the uh, at the Capitoline Hill um, of the equestrian statue of Marcus Aurelius, right. which is very, sort of, very well known. Yeah, that's probably the most famous statue of Marcus Aurelius. And it's also uh, an interesting monument to talk about in light of what we were discussing earlier, because we know um, that that statue survived because it was thought to be a statue of Constantine. And of course, Constantine was a Christian emperor. And so it was thought okay to allow that ancient Roman monument to stand. Whereas if it had been pagan Marcus Aurelius, it would not have lasted, right? So this idea of damnatio is not something that is restricted to ancient Rome. It's it, by a different name happened in lots of different um, periods and, and cultures around the world. So there were there there are many instances of Christian desecration of Greek and Roman monuments because they were seen as pagan and therefore not worth preserving. And just maybe as a last thought, like and that, that equestrian model, right, has a is a big inspiration, you know, for lots of sort of military um, or, or, or lead, um, images or representations of, of leaders, public statues, and, right. and probably the model that a lot of the, some of the, because there's Confederate monuments, right? So, and it's, uh, it's interesting yeah. too, uh, just yesterday, I think I was reading a story about the new monument to Dwight D. Eisenhower, which is to be unveiled today or tomorrow, I think, in Washington. Um, and it's also a monument of a different sort. Um, and I heard that he specifically said to his family, 
I don't want to be portrayed on a horse. <laughs> and so there is this long history, as, as you say, of leaders being portrayed as equestrian leaders. And that was specifically something that he did not want. Well, I know I want to wrap up here, but there's some great comments. Someone says approachable. I think about Obama. There's a wonderful anonymous comment. The Arapachas uh, Augusta, which is a monument to Augustan peace, right? This um, sort of, uh, it's a, it's a uh, altar, right? Um, like this portrait of Obama has a very symbolic set of floral motifs. That's a really wonderful uh, connection. Thank you for that. Uh, Bentley says Obama is clearly, clearly setting himself apart from the Oval Office. Has there ever has there ever been plant life in the Oval, Oval Office? Right, it's a distinct space, and Obama is setting his portrait outside the literal seat of executive power. Maybe this idea of being amongst right everybody else in this sort of shared environment. I really like that sort of interpretation. So um, I know we could keep on going for hours. I know um, I want to thank all of you for joining us and participating in the conversation. I want to thank you, Seth, for sharing your knowledge. Um, and also just sharing your way of thinking about things. So we appreciate it greatly. Thank you, Andrew. It was a lot of fun. Great. Uh, and I just want to let you all know that desktop dialogues have been made possible in part by the National Endowment for the Humanities, exploring the human endeavor. Um, next Wednesday, September 23rd at noon, please join my colleague Kijo Lee uh, for breaking the form, of uh, revising the form, sorry, during which she will discuss artistic revisions by artists Simone Lee and Amy Sherald, that portrait by, uh, of Michelle Obama, um, that amend the canonical European portrait and make black women's enduring power and historical influence visible. So please uh, come to that program. It'll continue the conversation that we started today. And don't forget to vote. Learn about your voting options. Check your status or request an absentee ballot at ohvotes.org. We're going to share that as well. Um, if you'd like to explore more of the work in our collection, visit CMA Collection online. We have a link to that. And if we didn't get to your question or comment during the program, uh, and if you have more, you can always go to our Lens Ask on the CMA website, and someone will get back to you with an answer. Um, so. Uh, we have a link for that. So thank you all for coming, um, and we'll see you uh, soon.